Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for how good you are to us. Lord, we are just sitting here today praising and worshiping you for your love and your goodness to us. Lord, I ask now that you would bless this service. We want to dedicate this time to you. We want to ask that everything that is said and done will be to your honor and to your glory. Lord, may you just be with us as we sing praises to your name. Pray also that you would be with Pastor as he preaches today. I pray that you would fill him with your strength and with your power. And Lord, may we just hear from your word today and be challenged and encouraged. And so, Lord, we're just looking forward to the good time of fellowship around your word and then also together afterwards. We pray now your blessing on this service. We dedicate this time to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to ask you to stand. We're going to sing together, and we want to just basically raise the roof off of this place as we sing praises to our God, and we want you to just sing out uh, as loud as you can uh, to the Lord.
come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Good morning. And welcome to First Baptist Church at Westwood Lake. We were so happy to see a great number of you here this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. And we also want to welcome those who are online watching us likewise this morning. And we want to welcome all our first time visitors. We do have a couple, uh, Eric and Tani Snyder. Would you please stand so we can recognize you? There they are. God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, they are also healthcare workers. And I believe that, Tani, you've been to our school. You were uh, part of our school here years ago. All right. And they also have children in our preschool. God bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for being with us. And do we have anyone else that's first time with us uh, in our service this morning besides the Snyder family? Uh, we do have someone over there. All right, Nursey, you want to introduce a uh, gentleman? Please stand. All righty. Oh, great. Bienvenido. Que Dios me lo bendiga. Usted, gracias. Se puede sentar. Muchas gracias. Bienvenido. All right. Anyone else? All oh, right. Oh, we do have some other lady. All oh, right. Praise God. Yes, ma'am. Your name? Maylene. Maylene. God bless you, Maylene. Thank you for coming this morning. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. All right. We want to miss no one here. It's okay. Praise God. All of you that are here. The beautiful flowers arrangement that you see on the communion table are from the Montagudo family, uh, passing of their mom and dad. Uh, this past week, uh, we had the burial service uh, for Mr. and Mrs. Suarez, and we'd like to please pray for the Montagudo and the Suarez family. At the same time, please pray for Laura Wilson, uh, our sister in Christ. She's in the hospital, and uh, please we'd like to pray for her at this time. And then those of you that have been giving online, we want to thank you for your faithfulness. And also those uh, that are giving up back there, we have two boxes. Uh, you can also continue to give as you leave the service, your tithe and offering. Thank you again for your faithfulness and for your love to the Lord Jesus and to this ministry. Uh, would you please take your Bibles at this time? And I would like you to follow with me. Um, would you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning? We're looking at the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 9. We're looking at Ezra chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. We will alternate. I'll read verse 1, then all together verse 2. I'll read verse 3, and then all together verse 4. Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. Now when the, these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites together. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, for that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the land of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished together. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll bless your word to our hearts. That's why we're here. We're here to hear your word, and for you to talk to us and change us a little bit more to be more like Jesus. We pray you'll bless our preacher, anoint him with power from up high. And Lord, may we say at the end of the service, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Speak to us this morning as you have in the past. We pray that if there's one here that does not know you as Savior and Lord, Father, before they leave this premises, before they leave this place, 
May they open their heart and receive you uh, as their Savior. And then, Lord Jesus, I pray for the rest of us. Uh, maybe some of us may be walking far from you. I don't know. But, Lord, I just pray that your word today will draw us close to you and we will give ourselves to you. And, Father, may we continue to trust you. Thank you for providing. Thank you for protecting us. Now we just pray of your way you will. Talk to us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great worship time we've had today. Thank you, young people. This is from our program department. Thank you so much for blessing our hearts. And the special music, again, was great. We're in Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9 today. This is actually our seventh uh, 
lesson here that uh, we have been going through the book, the seventh message. And of course, uh, today and the next couple of lessons, we're going to be talking about revival in Jerusalem. Revival in Jerusalem. It's been a long time since revival had been in that city. And now Ezra has returned. And as we see in chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, Now when these things were done. In other words, from chapter 8 to chapter 9, it's been about a period of four months. And the preaching of the Word of God has been consistently been going on. You understand revival often begins with one person. With one person truly getting right with God. They confess their sin and they obey God. It was R.A. Torrey that once said, I can give a prescription that will bring revival. Revival to any church or to any community, to any city that's here on the face of the earth. He said, first of all, let few Christians get thoroughly right with God. If this is not done, the rest will come to nothing. Secondly, let them bind themselves together to pray for revival until God opens the windows of heaven and comes down. And then third, let them put themselves at the disposal of God for his use as see, he sees fit in winning others to Christ. That will be genuine revival. Yes, chapter 9 and 10 contain the story of a great revival that we will be looking at in the next few weeks, and today we will begin. What we find here is so much a part of the building program. You see, it was Zerubbabel that returned back 70-plus years earlier and brought a group of 50,000 exiles, and they came back home. They had been out of there for 70 years. And he rebuilt the temple with God's help. Of course, there was opposition. Of course, uh, it stopped. But eventually, it got started again. And then for a period of 16 years, devastation set in. People kind of got back to their own ways. People kind of got back away from God. And this is when God raised up Ezra. Ezra was called of God to leave Babylon and to bring a group of exiles to come back with him. And you see, the things that were going to be different now is ex, uh, Ezra was a priest. Ezra was a scribe. And it was on his heart because he knew the word of God. He knew those first five books of the Bible. In fact, he had them memorized. And he'd come and pour the word of God into people's lives. When Ezra would come, we understand the work of God is never building buildings but his primary tool is the word of the living God to reach people. You see, to be broken is the beginning of revival. When one comes to the end of himself and sees, I don't like what I see. Of course, God doesn't. God has never liked what our sins and what we're going on. But when we realize that, when we come to that fact and to that place, then God's able to work. And God's able to do a wonderful work. You see, it's painful. It's very humiliating. But it's the only way. Although brokenness is humiliating, God will use it to draw us nearer to him and allow our lives to be more like the master. You see, every person has an abandoned determination to control his or her own life. We want to do what we want to do. We want to be our own boss. But if we want to truly, truly experience revival, we must surrender our will to Christ. Coming to him on the terms of our Lord and his word that he lays out for what he wants from us. And when we yield our lives to him, we learn to live life the way God has planned it, the crucified life. I die daily. And we learn to embrace the tremendous truths of the cross and what brokenness is all about. Church, we will never, ever see a movement among God's people without conviction of sin. 
We will not see that. It won't happen. There has to come to a place in our own walk and our own relationship that we see it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And you see, whenever conviction is present, there will be at least three ingredients. And that's what I want to look at in these very first four verses of chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. We see the three ingredients that we have displayed for here, us here of what conviction is all about. First of all, it can't happen without the words of Scripture. No politician is going to bring about revival. No uh, big CEOs are going to say, we're going to make this economy so much greater. That won't change the way we're going in the direction we're heading. As I mentioned in chapter 9, now when these things were done, that's a period of four months between chapter 8 and chapter 9. Ezra had been faithful. Ezra had been busy doing what? Preaching the truths of the Word of God faithfully. When they were doing this, God was starting to work. Ezra had been faithful. You see, it was the decree of Artaxerxes that uh, he told Ezra, go back to your homeland and set up providences. You set up governors, you set up leaders, rulers, and you set up judgment systems, both civil and religious order. That's what they've been lacking. And when these things are taking place, then you faithfully preach the truths of the Word of God. There's one thing we know for sure about Ezra. Ezra preached the Word of God to the people. You see, the Word has already been uh, received to him what was going on in his land from Babylon. He heard about the mixed marriages. He heard about the sins that were happening in their part of the world. And so he's already prepared for it. And if you go back to chapter 7, if you remember verse 10, it says, for Ezra, this is while he was still in Babylon, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. He was burdened. He was moved. He says the children of Israel need to get right with God and he said he was going to do it and teach it in Israel the statues and the judgments and so we see him doing just that uh, to go back and teach them the commandments to the people of God and then we see in verse 26 of chapter 7 and it says whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or imprisonment. Boy, King Artaxerxes was behind him all the way. You go back, and you make sure the people get right with God. So Ezra took this position, his calling, seriously as a commander of God of Israel. And what was his command? To do just what is going on in pulpits across this land and across the world today, to preach the total truths of the Word of God. And that's what he was faithfully doing. He was preaching the Word. He was, yes, a faithful scribe. And yes, he was a faithful priest. And I want to tell you, I'm so thankful for men like Ezra. He wouldn't back down. He didn't have a backbone that was kind of... Uh, flimsy he had a backbone that he stood straight on the truths of the word of God and even when it would hurt he would preach the truths of the word of God he proclaimed the word of scripture folks church you will never see revival personally or corporately apart from what this book tells us the word of God if we are going to follow this book then we have you see when the word of God comes then the Spirit of God is able to move. And that's what we want. We want the Spirit of God. Move. You know, I tell you each Sunday, I, I'm just amazed of what's going on in our world today. It's getting further and further away from God. Can God do a work? I believe He can. But it's going to take a few that are going to get right with God. And then that few is going to enlarge, and we're going to see more adding on. As you and I examine Ezra's preaching ministry. I want you to notice two things here as we see the words of Scripture that he preached. The very first thing, his preaching was specific. 
His preaching was specific. We, we learn by how the crowd responds that Ezra not only preached generally, but he did preach specifically because it touched the hearts of some of the children of Israel. That's where preachers get in trouble, though, when they start preaching specifically. You know, when you start getting on my, my bandwagon, on my hobby horse, then you've got a problem. Then you have an issue. And, and, and some people turn the preacher off. But that's not Ezra. Ezra was preaching specifically. God uses this to get the people right. God uses this. Well, what did Ezra preach about? Well, historians tell us that Ezra had the first five books of the Bible memorized. He was a scribe. He wrote them over and over and over again. He knew those books. He understood them. He was able to quote the Torah from his own personal Bible study that he had. And when Ezra first came to Jerusalem, you could believe that he preached those first five chapters of the book of the Bible. And I'm sure when Ezra got up to preach to the people in Nehemiah chapter 8, it says they made him a wooden platform, uh, something like this, something that he could stand behind. And he started preaching. And I believe he probably started maybe in what we call the book of Genesis. And when he started in the book of Genesis, he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he had the crowd with him. They were saying, preach it, Ezra. We are wanting to hear what you're telling us. And then he talked about Adam and Eve. And they shouted in the congregation, Amen, Ezra. Yes, you're right, Adam and Eve. Yes, continue to preach. And then he talked about the fall and the sin in Genesis chapter 3. That's right, brother. That's right, Ezra. We have fallen away from you. Then Ezra talked about Cain killing his brother Abel. Oh, my. Oh, my, Ezra. Yes, that is true. Preach it, Ezra. You make sure the words of God are spoken. Then he spoke about Noah and how the world was destroyed in a flood and how God said he would never do it again. And the people said, Hallelujah! That's right. God promised. That's the promise of the, of the rainbow that you'll never destroy the earth again. And then in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, he talks about the Tower of Babel. And there in the Tower of Babel, how the people were wanting to reach God and made this big, huge tower, and God had to divide them. Then he got over to the call of Abraham, the father of the nations. Oh, he had the congregation go with him. Ezra, praise the Lord. You're right. God raised himself up a nation. He called Abraham to go to a land that he had never been before. And he said that I will multiply your seed. Then he talked about Isaac and Jacob. And the people in the congregation, congregation said, that's my God. That's my God, Ezra. You are right on. We're the people of God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He talked about how they took Joseph and threw him into a pit and then later sold him into slavery and how he was accused uh, in Potiphar's house uh, for, innocent, uh, for not doing anything and thrown into prison. And then God would raise him up and then he would make him the leader of, second leader, the highest leader in the land of Egypt where God was going to be preserving his people and that they would be able to continue on. His sovereignty was overseen. People were now at this point excited. They were applauding. Come on, Ezra, don't stop now. You are really hitting it. You keep preaching. Then he talked about how Israel started to multiply. And Pharaoh placed him into bondage, made him slaves. And for 400 years, the children of Israel cried out to God, God, send us a deliverer, send us a Messiah that is going to get us out of this situation. He talked about how Moses went before the people. Let my people go, Moses would say. He talked about the plagues of the frogs and the flies and the fleas. Now you're preaching, Brother Ezra. Now you're preaching. You are right on. Thank you, Ezra. Keep it going. And then he talked about the blood of the Passover lamb and how the blood would be applied on the door and any door that had the blood on it, the Passover lamb would pass over. And I'm sure if the song was available then, they might have started out singing, singing, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. Jesus. 
Oh, it was going well, and everybody was excited. He talked about the Red Sea and the manna and the quail, and he talked about the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and they were excited. Everybody is really excited at this point. They're all standing to their feet, and they're just applauding, and they said, thank you, thank you, Ezra. Thank you for bringing the word of God to us. And then it kind of got quiet until he started preaching about Moses. Exodus chapter 40, 34. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Numbers chapter 33. That's when Moses started talking about do not intermarry. That's when Moses was sharing the truths of God's word. That if you do, they will prick at your side as a thorn in the flesh. When you allow your sons to marry their daughters and give your daughters to their sons to be married, you will not teach them to be faithful to me. They will drive you into idolatry and they will cause you to curse me. Now the audience is quiet. No longer are they applauding him. Why? Because conviction was starting to set in. Conviction was starting to speak to their hearts and they knew you see, if this were our day, modernize it. Ezra would preach his sermon. Ezra would get uh, done, and, and uh, he got home in Sunday lunch, and he turned to his wife. Honey, I just don't understand. They were with me. I mean, the crowd was so excited, and the crowd was active, and they were involved. Did I not smile enough, honey? That, that, was there, did my illustration fall flat? Did I preach too long? And he was just beside himself. He couldn't understand why in the world. People just became silent. People were no longer a part of it. People were not there. What he doesn't realize, what we do realize at the end of the chapters here, is we look through them, his preaching became too specific. You see, he started stepping on toes. You see, the Spirit of God was beginning to move and to stir among the congregation, and the people were listening, and the people were hearing. Now God is talking to me. This is fine to hear all these other stories, but now God's talking to me. Occasionally in, in my own preaching ministry, I... You know, we'll preach most likely expository book by book. And that way, you know, people can't accuse me that I go home on a week and start studying a book because I know of a particular sin that maybe a family member or a church member is involved in. And I'll preach at it, maybe spend a few minutes. No, as I preach expository, as we're doing here, going through the book of Ezra, maybe I spend a couple minutes on maybe a particular specific thing that was bothering them. And they get home. And he turns, the husband turns wife, did you talk to the preacher? Kids, did you go up to the preacher and let him know what's going on in our home? How does he know? How has he evolved? And mentioning my sin, talking about me. Remember, had been on his face asking God to move. Movement of God, the Spirit of God to, to move among the church, to move among the nation of Israel. Church, it was a work of God preaching because it was specific. There's a, a second thing I want you to see there, that the problem was symbolic or figurative. There in 1 Kings chapter 11 and Jeremiah 17, in just a moment we'll look at that, but specifically what they had done is they intermarried with the children. They had been warned. They had been told over and over again, nation, don't do this. Because when you do, it's going to create problems. Now, understand, it's nothing to do with the tone or color of the skin that God's word is talking about here. It has to do with the tone and the color of the heart. In fact, we have in the New Testament scripture there in 2 Corinthians, it says, do not be unequally yoked together because it will create problems, because it will cause issues later when you start raising children and the wife wants them to go to this 
and this, and they're not a believer, or he's not a believer, and they never go to church with you, it will create problems. I submit to you, it was symbolic of a much greater desire to sin. It might not be intermarrying that God is talking about in your heart today. Something symbolic that God is using and speaking and saying, you need to deal with this. I'll never bring blessings. I'll never bring you closer to me until you deal with that situation. It's a sin to marry an unbeliever is what he was saying. It's also very dumb, young people, to date an unbeliever. Why? It's just, you know, we're just going to, Maybe just uh, have fun and go on a, you know, a, a, a group gathering, a group gather. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together and you will have issues if you don't listen to God's word. Heard a story about a young man that was just so sweet on this young lady. She was a believer. She came from a Christian home and, and the parent says, absolutely no. You are not to date that young man. He doesn't know God. He doesn't believe in God. Well, somehow, some way, he started to come to church with her. And he walked up the aisle with her one Sunday, and he said, Preacher, I want to get saved. And he went through the motions. Fast forward, he was able to marry her because he made a profession. An empty profession but a profession, and as they were leaving the church and getting ready for the honeymoon, he says, Shoo, that's the last time I'm going to that church. She said, what do you mean? Said, Honey, the only way I could get you, and your parents allow me to have you, is that I would make some decision, but that was fake, and that was false. I want to share a personal experience with you. In our family, my, my brother-in-law literally broke my parents, my in-laws' hearts, he started dating a girl that was Jehovah Witness. She was a JW. Her family had been in it for a long time. But she came to church, and she walked the aisle, and she made some decision. We baptized her. Well, after my brother-in-law died in, an accident, in a motorcycle accident, a year later, she calls my wife, and she says, I, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm going back to the Jehovah Witness church. She married a Jehovah Witness man. It really grieved my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. They couldn't send them presents at Christmas. They couldn't celebrate their birthdays. They couldn't do these things for them. And their heart was broken. They didn't want their grandchildren never to know God. Church, God gives us a warning, and a warning is there, and it was given to the nation of Israel, and they didn't listen. Jeremiah reminds us that this heart is deceitful. You know, sometimes people will say, follow your heart, the dumbest idea in the world, because the heart will lead you to destruction, Jeremiah says. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? The sin tells us, or the Bible tells us, to guard our hearts not to follow our hearts, because this heart can lead us astray. We won't recognize our sins. We're not willing to, to maybe to see an, an area that we're guilty. Maybe it's of unforgiveness. We're just not willing to forgive somebody of an issue or of a problem. You know what we usually do? We look at others. And we think, wow, their sin's far worse than mine. I'm okay. I'm comfortable church, we will never be right with God until we have conviction. Until we truly follow the word of God. There's a second point I want you to see, the second ingredient as we find in our passage here. It was the working of the Spirit. The working of the Spirit. After Ezra preaches, we call what happens the invitation. We do that here in our church at the end of the service. We'll have an invitation. We'll have a calling 
And if God is speaking to hearts, we invite people to come and we invite people to pour their heart out to the Lord. Well, he is at home and there's a knock at his door. About 2.30 now, the service had been over quite a while and Ezra is still wondering what in the world happened and it was the leaders of the church. It was some of the deacons and the committee members and the high, high officials. Ezra, we need to talk to you. Look at verse 2. Chapter 9. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed has mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. Ezra, we want to come talk to you. Notice it, it uses the, the pronoun of others, they. And they come to, you know why? It wasn't that you weren't smiling enough, Ezra. And Ezra, it wasn't that you preached too long. And Ezra, your, your, your illustration really didn't fall flat. But you brought the people under conviction. They, they hadn't hit themselves yet. And they were trying to tell Ezra, Ezra, you were right on. What you were saying, what you were proclaiming was true. We see the working of the Spirit. They say, Ezra, you don't know this, but the people have been living in sin. Well, he did. He'd heard about it. And he'd been praying for that for years before God ever brought him there. We have to confess, not only have they been doing it, but we are the chiefest of the sinners. We are the ones that you've been preaching to. As we think about the working of the Spirit, there's two simple things that I think are there that are needing to be brought to our attention. The very first thing is how powerful the Word of God is, how powerful the truth of Scripture is. Mom, dads, you can't get your kids under conviction. It never happened. You can holler at them, you can yell at them, you can tell them you don't want them to do this, you want them to stop doing that. But until God deals with their heart, it falls on empty ears. They're not going to listen. We need to pray the moving of the Holy Spirit upon the lives of our kids. Moms, you're not going to get your husband right. You're going to try as much as you want to, to, to tell him you need to come to church, or you need to do this, until God deals with them, until they see their sin, until they recognize their wrongdoing. It's never going to change how powerful it was. Young person, you're concerned about maybe your mom or dad that are not living for God. Guess what? You can't change them. You can try everything you want and you can do as much influence as you can, but you need to pray that the Holy Spirit would do the work in their lives. That the Holy Spirit, you need to do what Ezra did. You need to get on your face and fall before God. And I don't know how long you need to do it, but you need to do it continuously. Pray Pray, pray that God would do a work in your parents' life. His preaching was in the power of God. You know, sometimes God can use the worst of sermons. You know, I've been preaching now for over almost 50 plus years. And my wife will tell you I have some, had some bad sermons along the way. And she'll remind me of it when I get home. Boy, you blew it today. And I start thinking, what did I do wrong, you know? And, she says, and, and she'll start saying these different things and all. But I want you to understand, sometimes it's not the sermon that God brings conviction. God can use the worst of the worst messages that a messenger can bring, but God can get a hold of the person's heart that's sitting there. And it might be just a few little things that the message of Scripture was speaking, and that person came under such deep conviction. And they were moving, and they were working that way. It's the power of God, the powerful working of the Spirit of God in the life of a child of God that wants God to work, that wants God to, to deal with their heart. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Say, thank you, Lord. I don't know what you're trying to teach me. It's the loving hand of our first faithful God working in you by the power of the Spirit of God. Well, how powerful it was? Then notice, secondly, in these verses 1 to 4, it was personal. It was powerful. You see, the priests, the Levites, the leaders of all the people there in the nation of Israel, first they used that 
pronoun others. Now, the third per- person of the pronoun, now they're saying, it's us. You remember the Apostle Paul? He made this comment or said something like this. I am the chiefest of sinners. Now, I know he was a bad. He was really bad. He persecuted Christians. But folks, when God saved him, that guy changed Old things were passed away. Behold, all things were becoming new. He was a new creature in Christ. And I tell you, he possibly, in my opinion, one of the strongest and the greatest Christians that was uh, walked the face of this earth. But he says this, who, I'm the chiefest of sinners. The one that has done all of this. Ezra, you've come to tell us what we've been doing. You know, the easiest thing in the world to do is to confess somebody else's sin. And we can pray for that, but, you know, to confess our own sins. God, get a hold of my husband. God, get a hold of my wife. God, get a hold of my children. Why was their sin the worst? These were the leaders of the leaders of the entire nation. Because, you see, when we are really, truly right with God, and... We are in that situation. We will see our sins are the worst. Paul, arguably the greatest, yet he said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. May we say it's not just the leaders of the church, but every father and every mother, every teenager. We have a calling. We have a responsibility. Young people, the people that you hang around with, are you being a great influence or are they bringing you down? Moms, Are you being that leader of the home that you ought to be supporting your husband? Fathers, are you following God's guidelines of leading your family in devotions and and having the special time that you are trying to see your family built up? These leaders were saying this, and they were saying this, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the way of prayer. And until we come to that location, until we come to that place, it's never going to work. Yes, their work was powerful, the Holy Spirit was powerful, and the work of the Holy Spirit was personal. Love Jonathan Edwards. If you've ever read any of his books, you uh, haven't, I encourage you to do so. You see, he was an amazing preacher. When he would preach, the church would get emotional. In fact, he wasn't Pentecostal, but people were standing and they were excited and they were clapping and they were so involved. And, and you know, you always have your critics. They're all of us to say, oh, his preaching is emotional, moving, and it gets people to do that. So you know what he tried to do? He does this. He writes a book to answer his critics. And the book, and you might want to pick it up sometime or look it up on the uh, Google, Distinguishing Marks of the Spirit of God. Distinguishing Marks of the Spirit of God. You see, he was responding to his critics in an essay form. In it, he defends the ministry. He states it's not that Satan is involved in waking the conscience by exposing sin. Satan would just love us to stay in our sin. He would love to keep you right where you are. It's Satan's interest just to lull your conscience to sleep and quiet the believer. When God's at work, there will be a conviction of sin. When there's a genuine conviction of sin, folks, God's working. God's moving. And God is bringing to to light things in our lives that we need to change. When you and I are broken before God and convicted over our sin and wanting to get right with God, then we can say we've been in the presence of God because he's a holy God and his holiness demands for us to be holy. And you can never be in his presence until all our sins are washed away. Conviction of sin involves the words of Scripture. It involves the work of the Spirit. But let me close finally with the weeping of the sinner. We don't see it as often as we should. But here in verse 3, listen to what it says. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and I plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and I sat down astonished. Astonished. Jonathan, 
or excuse me, George Whitfield, on Pever February 17, 1739, held one of the first open tent revival meetings. It was an old coal miner town, and they would set it up. They had the tent, and everything was to, to be ready, and they set the chairs up, and the coal miners, you know, they, they would work late, and they didn't have time to go home in chains. They would just come from the coal mine, and so they would be filled with smut and dirt and grime, but they were coming to the, to the re tent meeting, to the revival. And George Whitfield would preach, and George Whitfield would share the truths of the Word of God. And, and you would look at those coal miners. You know what happens when you work in a coal mine all day long. You are just filled with all the smut of the coal mine, the darkness, the black coal. And they were sitting there listening to George Whitfield preach the Word of God. They got under conviction. And you know what happened? Those ha uh, hard, strong coal miners were weeping. They were breaking. And you know what was happening? Their tears were starting to flow down. And now you're starting to see white. He just got over it. You know, God was moving and God was working. Why? Because the Spirit of God. And, and there was weeping happening to them. Certainly, we see God was moving. You remember Peter? After he betrayed his Lord. He goes away from that fire and cries out in grief to God. There's a, there's a grief that was expressed. There's a grief that was noticed. And it says here, Ezra rent his clothes. He tore them off. He plucked the hairs of his head, his beard. And it says, he sat down astonished, astonished. Quite a different from the average prayer of a Christian. You know, sometimes we'll pray, Lord, if there's anything I've done wrong, would you forgive it? We know what we did. We don't pray if there is. Lord, bring conviction to me about my sin. Help me, Lord, break me. Help me to get over this sin. He sat down, astonished. That word astonished, it's in the Strong's Concordance says to be appalled to be devastated, to be desolate, to be decimated, to be ruined, to be shocked. Ezra confesses to the Lord that he is ashamed, that he is embarrassed because of his iniquities of his people. When's the last time you were brokenhearted over something that you did or maybe something that you said? that you literally were unable to stand and you just dropped as Ezra to his face and you were overcome, you were overwhelmed, you were decimated, you were ruined, you were destroyed and ravished, dropping to your knees and doing what verse 4 tells us. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled. Here's Ezra preaching and revival is starting to take place in the nation of Israel. They were trembling what? At the politician's words or the big CEO? No. It says that the word of God, God's word was doing a work, trembling in the presence of God. We are God's people, and we need to examine our own lives. You know, every time we come to the Lord's table, we read that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let a man examine himself, because if he comes to this table unworthily, damnation shall be upon him. We don't want to come to the throne of God. We don't want to come into his presence if there's known sin. And, and we shouldn't pray, well, Lord, if there's anything. No, no. We know what it is. Let's give it to the Lord. Let's make it right. Yes, grief was expressed, but there's a second thing I want you to see and I think it needs to be mentioned, and we won't find it till our next lesson and our, our final lesson of Ezra, but grace was experienced. There at the end of chapter 9 and, and verse uh, 15 says, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped. And then back at verse 8, and now for a little space, grace has been shown from the Lord our God. Aren't you grateful for grace? Aren't you grateful that God shed his blood on that cross that he could offer us grace and mercy something we don't deserve something that he's given to us because he loves us grace was experienced 
You see, you can't leave the story here without understanding that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fast forward 500 years ahead is same temple. The children of Israel were standing there and the priests were busily doing their job. The Levitical uh, were doing their duties. And all of a sudden, a week before Passover, the east gate swings wide open and our Savior's coming on a colt that has not been broken. He's coming into town and the people are singing, Hosanna! He's coming, our Messiah! And they're yelling and they're excited and they're shouting and then fast forward to the end of the week. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas comes where Jesus is praying. The one I kiss is the one that's the one you want. He gives a betrayal kiss. And Peter gets excited and he gets over to soldiers and cuts off one of those soldiers' ears. And fortunately, Jesus was there and able to do the miracles. So he would have been one of the ones on the cross that day if he hadn't have. And we see they take him before Caiaphas. And there, Caiaphas, he has an illegal trial, and, and, and then he's brought to Herod. And then he's brought to Pilate. Now, Pilate was wanting to wash his hands of this innocent man. I don't want anything to do with him. You know, he doesn't, I don't find anything wrong. And the people are saying, crucify him. We don't want anything to do with him. And he says, so be it. You can hear it in the background as you're standing there at that temple that Zerubbabel rebuilt. And you can hear the Roman soldiers taking that cat of nine tails. Whip after whip after whip upon our Savior. 40 minus 1, 39 whips. His body was mutilated. He was ravished. And we see him then given a cross. And fast forward, they move him to the area of the... Skull, Calvary. And he put it there in the ground. And there in the ground, people would come by, and those that were so most faithful to him, they would see him. And if you listen carefully from that skull shaped hill, you hear our Savior in Hebrew saying, Telistatai, Telistatai, meaning it is. I paid the price for the sins of man. The price of redemption has been laid down. And Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit to you. And it's upon that basis of the death of Jesus Christ that we, like those disobedient Israelites, can agree with John there in 1 John chapter 1 if we confess our sins. He's just and faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because he's faithful. Why? Because he's just. And he took your sins and he took my sins. If we today confess our sins, he is faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today you might be living in your sins. And you find yourself like Ezra weeping and broken and crying out to God. God, do something. I want your spirit in my life. I want you to move. I want you to work. And we press on to the end of the story of Calvary, the empty tomb, into what Jesus Christ has done for us. You see, friends, once we spend time with him, you'll be walking away singing that song at Calvary. Calvary is where I trembled and the law was spurned till my guilty soul imploring turn. They hear the good news. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Where? At Calvary. Church, Ezra, speaking to our church today in the 21st century. And he is broken to see his nation that way. And you know, God is broken to see what's happening in our nation. When's the last time you prayed for our nation? When's the last time you've been on your face and asking God to work? In just a few months, we will be electing a leader to lead this nation the next four years. 
and they're two very opposite people that are running. How are we responding? Are we asking God to work? Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you that your pardon was multiplied to me many years ago and how my burdened soul found liberty. Thank you for the freedom that you give as we come under the conviction of sin today. Lord, if there's one today that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, work in their heart. Help them to see their need of Jesus Christ. As we call the invitation today, may we respond in our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and our worship team is going to come back, and they're going to sing our closing worship song, Just As I Am. Excuse me, not that. It's the other song, I believe, but they're going to sing for us. Would you... Stand and let God speak and work in your hearts today. All, all to the altar is what they're singing today. Yeah.